Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, today I'd like to talk about these two very important concepts finding zeros of a function and what's called the factor theorem. Uh, these uh, two topics are the climax of this chapter, uh, so to speak. In fact, it will take us uh, uh, this session and probably in the next two into trying to. Uh, 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 understand some of the details of these two topics. Um, I, I request you uh, to be uh, patient because it does uh, it, it individually each topic is not very difficult but you have to try to put it all together and if if you have a deep understanding of this I think you will enjoy this uh, a lot um, inshallah. So um, finding zeros of a polynomial function okay um, now, that's uh, that's the topic, and in doing this, uh, we use synthetic substitution a lot. Okay, and if you recall, it's synthetic substitution. We use synthetic substitution to find the value of a function for a certain value of x, right? And we use synthetic substitution for long division, so to speak, making long division. Uh, short long division shortcut and then we said previously we use synthetic substitution to find the zeros of a function or the x-intercepts now so we're going to relate how this is used to uh, to find the x-intercepts and then there's another concept that we know from before and that is the zero product that is zero product property okay and this is that when a times b equals zero this means that a equals zero or b equals zero okay so zero product property now what does all these things have to do with what we're talking about this will make sense to you and we have used zero properties before to for solving equations like this x minus 2 my x minus 3 equals 0 then we said x minus 2 equals 0 or x minus 3 equals 0 okay so these concepts are going to be linked uh, uh, in trying to find uh, the uh, zeros of a function so you uh, our goal is to um, kind of lay an outline of what we're hunting for and what we are hunting for is actually zeros of the function. So let's talk about then how what the zeros of the functions are. And then we're going to talk about how we use synthetic substitution and the zero product property in finding the zeros. Okay, inshallah. So let's talk about what a zeros of the function is. Now, simplistically speaking, okay, a zero of a function is basically a the uh the x-intercept of the function. So if you, if you have a line like this, okay, that's the zero of this function. <coughs> it's another word for it. It's an uh, uh, x-intercept. Where there's a certain num uh, uh, s, let's call this s, I'm going to use s as the x-intercept, and the y value would be zero, right? So if you have a line like this, that would be the x-intercept, okay? This, I'm just leaving, leaving those ordered pair like that. If we have a parabola, we have done this before, for example. That's a terrible looking parabola, but let's try this one. All right, and we call these x-intercepts, for example, like over here, right? We'd call them s1 and s2, and we know the x-intercept form of parabolas were f of x equals a times the quantity x minus s1 times the quantity x minus s2. Okay, and and then you realize that here also um, the ordered pair is going to be like this. Okay, so x-intercepts are are also known as basically the zeros. So what are the zeros of this function? It is s1 and s2. Those they are known as the zeros. It's like the cooler algebra two name for x-intercepts. So if you say x-intercept, you know. You identify 
yourself as algebra one student, so to speak. Anyways, so x intercepts are the zeros of a function. Now, why is this important? Now, we're talking about the subject of this chapter is, of course, polynomial functions, okay? Now, polynomial functions, they kind of like, you know, they squiggle around, snake around in the, on, the, on the plane like this, okay? That, that's how they look like, polynomial functions. The, the number of, of, you know, rills and, uh, rills and uh, hills and valleys depends on the degree of the polynomial, etc. Now, the reason zeros are very important for, for this is because they help us graph the function, see? If you knew the zeros of a polynomial function, it helps you graph. So, when we have a polynomial function, okay, such as, okay, let's say f of x, this one is f of x, okay? x to the, I don't know, x to the fourth minus 4x cubed minus 2x squared minus, let's say, 7. I skipped it, right? We use two things to graph this function, okay? To graph a polynomial function, there are two very important things that are written for us, okay? One thing that we need to graph this is the end behavior of a polynomial function, okay? We need to know the uh, we need we need to evaluate the end behavior. The second thing we need to know, okay, are the zeros of the functions. Okay. Now, I'm just going to review the end behavior business over here so you remember, okay? If you recall, for this particular function, the end behavior is determined by the degree of the function, by the degree of the function and the coefficient of the leading, uh, the, and the leading coefficient, okay? In this case, this coefficient is positive one. So if you recall, when we talk about, when we talk about end behavior, we look at these two graphs, okay, as models, okay? <coughs> f of x equals x squared, all right? And f of x equals x cubed, okay? So, a even degree function is going to behave like this, and an odd degree function is going to behave like this, okay? And if it's, if it's negative, it's like f of x is, okay, if this, if, if it's negative even degree, let's say if this was f of x equals negative 3x to the fourth, it's going to behave like negative x squared. It's going to behave like this. Okay? And you flip the mirror image of this. And if it's negative uh, a function like f of x equals negative 3x to the fifth, this is odd uh, degree function with a negative coefficient, it's going to be, its behavior is going to be modeled by this function right here, f of x equals negative x cubed. Now we have covered this, but it's important, so I'm reviewing this over here. So, now if we look at this function, the end behavior of this function is going to be modeled by, is going to be modeled by this behavior, uh, y equals x squared function, okay? So f of x equals x squared. So the end behavior is going to be the same as the behavior of this function, okay? Because this is an even degree function and the leading coefficient is a positive number, okay? So that means the end behavior of this particular function, I don't know how this function looks like, okay? I just made these, this graph over here, okay? So the behavior of this function is going to be like this. So the end behavior you can describe as, okay, for this function, as x goes to positive infinity, okay, as x goes to positive infinity, f of x goes to positive infinity, okay? And as x goes to negative infinity, that is, x goes this way, okay, then f of x goes to, is still going to positive infinity, positive infinity like this. So this is the end behavior of this function, correct? We got that. 
Now, I'm going to erase this. Okay. So now you know, see, if you were to graph this function, we know something like this, okay? Let me just, I don't remember exactly, but let me just write this. So f of x equals x to the fourth minus, I don't know, 5x cubed plus 5x cubed plus 4x squared minus, I don't know, 6, okay? What I know about this function is that its end behavior is going to be like this, right? Okay. So if I were to graph this, okay, if I were to graph this function, all right, uh, what I can what I can say for sure is that the end behavior is going to be like this, okay. So whatever the function is doing in between this, in the end is going to go this way, and then the, as x goes to positive infinity, it's going to go that way, right? So then the question is, what is the function doing in here, right? So, right, so if I knew that, I could just, like, plot it out like this, right? Okay. So, let me, let me do this one over here. It's x4 minus 5x cubed. So, y equals x to the exponent of 4 minus 5x to the exponent of 3. What else did I do? Plus 4x squared plus 4x squared. Okay, what else? And then minus 6 okay so that's the function I just kind of made up and as you can see the end behavior is that it goes like this it behaves like y equals x to the square right but how does it behave in between those two end behaviors okay let me magnify this right so here it is it's doing one of these okay how do I find how, find out what it's doing over here okay so, but knowing the x-intercept helps, okay? Knowing the x-intercept helps. So, if I knew the x-intercept of a function, for example, let's say if I knew the x-intercepts were this, this, and this, okay, for a particular function, then I could say, well, well if it has to intercept there, then well, it's going to have to come through over here, right? And then it has to intercept it. That means it has to going to have to take a turn here somewhere, right? And then it's going to have to intercept somewhere over there. It's going to have to take a turn again, right? Maybe it takes a turn like this. I don't know. But it has to take a turn somewhere. And then it has to, right? And then, well, if that's the only intercept that has to go back up, then it has to do one of these. You follow? So the x-intercepts are very, very helpful. The zeros of a function are very, very helpful in graphing polynomial functions, okay? So in graphing polynomial functions, okay, what we look for there then is number one, we look for end behavior of the function, okay? And then we look for zeros of the function. And this helps us graph the polynomial function. For example, I'll give you the, the one example here before I go on. Let's say I know the polynomial is behaves like this, okay? And behavior is like this. <coughs> For example, this could be f of x equals negative x to the fifth minus 4x to the fourth, blah, blah, blah. This is an odd number function with a negative coefficient, so it's going to behave like this is f of x cubed. And it's going to behave like this, opposite of this, because it's negative coefficient, right? So it's going to behave like the end behavior is going to resemble this. Okay. So I know I know this. Okay. Then if I knew if I knew the zeros were like one over here and one over here, then I could say, well, well it has to be like this then, right? It has to come over here and it has to turn somewhere, right? Well, if it had another zero, it would be like, okay, it's going to go over here like this, okay? And if it was, if it did not have that third zero, it has to like that it has to like go there one and touch it and just go back over here, like this, or like that. You know, you follow what I'm saying? So that's why the zeros are so important. Zeros are so important. Okay. Now the question then becomes how do we go find the zeros of functions that look like this okay for example negative 
of uh, 12x to the fifth minus 4x cubed minus 2x squared plus x minus uh, 3. How do we go find the x-intercepts of this, of a beastly looking function like this, right? So that's, that's where all the synthetic division stuff and all that comes into play, okay? Now, I'm going to explain to you also the basic concept of how we approach this, okay? Now, if you recall, let me just do this, okay? Let's say I have a polynomial function that's like this, okay? That's like this. Now, these are three x-intercepts, correct? These are the three x-intercepts. They have ordered pairs, okay? We can label those ordered pairs as, let's call this one S1, comma, 0, okay? This would be S2, comma, 0, and this would be S3, the third one, comma, 0, right? That's how all x except have y, uh, y is 0 uh, for their uh, ordered, uh, for the ordered pair, correct? So, that we understand. Another way of saying the same thing, another way of saying the same thing, listen carefully, listen carefully. Another way of the saying the same thing is, okay, if this is S1, okay, then if this is S1, okay, then F of S1 is what? Zero, right? If, if a number is a zero, if a number is a zero, then f of that number is a zero. That's what it means. If a number is an x-intercept, then the f of that number, okay, that's this value is zero. Does that make sense? So another way of expressing the same thought is saying that if a number is zero, then the f of that number is zero f of that number is 0. f of that number is 0. Okay? Then you see f of s1 equals 0, f of s2 equals 0, f of s3 equals 0. Correct? Then what we have to find therefore are the numbers for whom the, uh, the uh, f of that num value is zero, okay? You follow? Okay, now, let's assume, for example, let's assume that you are doing a synthetic substitution, okay? Let's say if you did a synthetic substitution for this function, f of x equals 3x cubed minus 4x squared minus 28x minus 16 and somebody told you well, just find out for me just would you what is f of negative 2 okay just just do me a favor just find that out okay so no problem i can do this i learned this negative 3 negative 4 negative 28 right and negative 16 okay then you say, okay, that's not hard. I could just do a synthetic substitution. So cool, and algebra 2. Okay, I put negative 2 over there. All right, so bring that 3 down, and be careful. Progressive logic reading it. That's negative 6. That's negative 10. That's going to be positive 20. That's negative 8. That's positive 16. And that is, whoa, 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 whoa. That is 0. Right? So, in other words, f of negative 2 is 0. Correct? That remainder, do you follow? F, this is, this we use synthetic substitution to find f of, of negative 2, and that's going to be 0. So, we just kind of, like, kind of like stumbled upon a 0 for this function, didn't we? We kind of stumbled upon a 0 for this function. Okay? Well... The question is, how do we get lucky and keep stumbling upon the zeros, so to speak, yeah? The question is, listen carefully, 
How do we get lucky, not lucky, intelligent, I guess it were. How do we do that? And stumble upon those zeros. You follow? Now you can see how synthetic substitution can be useful in finding the zeros. Okay, so the way we use synthetic substitution to find zeros is, one, we interview prospective zeros perspective zeros, okay, and to interview candidate zeros, call them candidate zeros, candidate zeros, okay, in other words, uh, we just make a best guess list of, of zeros and says, okay, who wants to go, for, okay, sir, you want to try to see if you want to be a, if a zero or a hero, he says, I want to be a hero, it's a zero, okay, you want to be a hero, that's a zero, okay, why don't you try, and he comes, because it gives a zero, he says, yeah, I'm a hero, that's a zero. Okay, it's kind of French, that thing. Anyways, so what you do is, you interview candidate zeros. You pick, you intelligently guess, and we're going to talk about that. Candidate zeros, okay? And then you use synthetic, as synthetic substitution to see if there are the zeros, okay? If there are zeros. Do you understand? So... How do you use synthetic substitu substitution to find zeros? Well, you you make good and you make a list of all potential candidates for zero who want to be hero, and then you use you try them all out. You think it's a lot of work, right? Yes. You try them all out, and it's not going to be that bad. Actually, we're going to have shortcuts too. You try them all out and see which one will give you this, right? Which one will give you that, and then you have a zero. And you have a zero, okay? And that's the basic concept behind this, okay? There's another concept that's related to this, okay? And that is the zero fact, uh, the, the zero product there, okay? Which I'm going to explain on, on this. I'm going to elaborate on this concept and explain how that is related. Until then, as-salatu wa-salamu 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 wa-sal